day which was required or 50% reduction in symptoms in these four groups. So the mean number of days required was 6.7 if you did not give supplementation, 5.5 if you give vitamin C, 5.9 if you give zinc, if you gave both vitamin C as well as zinc, and I'm saying this because everybody seems to be prescribing this right left and center everybody seems to be taking not only in Jharkhand but perhaps all over this country but may not necessarily be in other countries when you took both then uh, the number of days required for 50 percent reduction in symptoms was 5.5 so uh, even uh, though jing does not seem to be adding any maybe little bit of reduction, but basically vitamin C seems to be reducing the number of days required from 6.7 to 5.5, which is a difference of 1.2 days. So if you take vitamin C, you are 50% better one day earlier than when you did not take. So the question will be, <clears throat> is this not good enough to advise people vitamin C? And uh, uh, I always miss interaction when I do online classes. But uh, <clears throat> uh, Ravi, is there a way to take responses? Yes, sir. How can we take responses? How many people agree or disagree? Uh, sir, they can raise their hand, sir. Uh, there is an option of uh, raising hand. So if they, they will click on that, uh, they can raise their hand, sir. I see. So why don't you try? Let's see how many people think that we should take vitamin C because there is you get 50% better one day earlier. So that may be a good idea. Right. I can't see the responses, but <laughs> this is the problem with this uh, online thing. Sir gave his sponsor, they did the thumbs down, so uh, they can use reactions also. It is anyway, I, I am not able to see, so <laughs> this is the problem with online classes, anyway. So, so, there may be some people who may be persuaded to take it because if they become 50% better one day earlier, 1.2 days in this case, they may think, Why not take it? Vitamin C is not expensive. It's not very harmful, so uh, better take it. We will be I'll be getting better one day earlier. Others would like to uh, say that uh, oh, just one day after taking uh, so much uh, ascorbic acid or uh, vitamin C is not good enough. So there may be a difference of opinion as far as whether one day is a significant uh, difference or whether it is a clinically important difference. Or not. I should not say significant, but whether it is clinically important difference or not. Maybe some people will like to take advantage of one day, some people will like not to take advantage and say that I will not spend money on vitamin C just for one day. Difference. So there can be difference of opinion. But what is important to see is to, I can see some chat, uh, uh, this thing, so maybe some people are responding to that. So one issue is clinical importance. But there is, even if you found or thought that one day is a good enough, and let's say it's clinically important, important for patients, let's say, they, they want to take it. Uh, even then, there is one more issue. The other issue is that don't think that everybody who was not on supplement had 50% relief by 6.7 days. Everybody who was on vitamin C had 50% relief in 5.5 days. In fact, some may, uh, in this group of no supplementation, some would have been better maybe on third day, maybe on fourth day. 
maybe on some to eighth day or ninth day. Similarly, in vitamin C, there may be some people getting better on third day, fourth day, some getting better on sixth day, seventh day, or eighth day. What I mean to say is, though this is average number of days, there is also spread of the number of days within the group. So you should like to see how much is the spread. If the spread is more than two days, three days, maybe you should think whether this one day difference is really just because of chance. Chance in this case, by that we mean that maybe if you had taken instead of 200 patients, maybe 2000 patients, both have, may have become the same. So that's it, that is that is why we say that maybe by chance you got this one day difference. And obviously this is not a superfluous question because 214 patients, if this is established, then millions of patients around the world will take it. So before we say that, yes, this is a real difference, we would like to see uh, either in larger number of patients and see that this is persistent or we will certainly like to see how much is the variation of days within this group. So the next slide will tell you uh, why it stops moving. Sir, click on uh, slide with mouse, sir. Okay, yes. And then so, click on The way, yeah, right, thank you. So the, the way you will like to see the variation is that you should have uh, standard deviation. Standard deviation gives you some idea of how much is the spread of days. So you can see in no supplementation group, standard deviation is 4.4. In vitamin C group, it is 3.7. So roughly around four days of variation within the group. So you should ask if this much is the variation, then one day difference may be just uh, negligible or let's say just because uh, you had uh, some particular kinds or number of patients, so you got it. Maybe you have 10 patients more and it disappears. So this is what we say that you got it by chance. So how do people know? whether this is because of chance or it is because it is real. The way to do that is think about noise and signal. So the variation which occurs within the group is like noise. So uh, there is so much variability within the group. Then you see how much is the difference. Difference is the signal. So one day difference or 1.2 day difference is the signal. And this is uh, the noise, which is 4.4 and 3.7. Let's take four days. So four days is the noise and one day is the signal. So you can take signal to noise ratio, which will be in this case, one divided by four. If we take it as a uh, standard deviation of four, then you ask a question, is this ratio large enough to convince you that this might not have occurred by chance. And to do this, you have to go to some, uh, you know, already some computer programs where if you enter this ratio and also tell them that this we have got on the basis of 214 patients, they will tell you whether you are likely that you have seen this by chance or it is uh, real. How do they do that? First, they say that, look here, let us believe there is no difference. And then, given this much noise and this much signal, and this is the 1 by 4 is the signal to noise ratio, what is the chance that if there was no effect of vitamin C, that we will see as much difference as 1 in the background of noise, which is 4? And that ratio is uh, given different names and there are different uh, graphs or curves we don't need to go into that from which 
we can decipher that this is the probability that we will see this much difference or more if there was in reality no effect of vitamin C. That is what we say that we saw it by chance. That is what is called p-value. So p-value is calculated on the basis of what is called no difference hypothesis or also null hypothesis. Then you calculate the signal, you calculate the noise, take the ratio of signal to noise. Then you go to a computer program and say, this is the signal to noise ratio. What is the probability that this much ratio can be seen or little more uh, uh, or more than this can be seen on the basis of uh, what we have done or what is what does the study show that is what is called p value so two things to remember p value is calculated on the basis of null hypothesis and then what do they do they calculate the signal which is the difference of one in this case or 1.2 they calculate the noise which is the standard deviation then take the ratio Based on ratio, you can uh, get what is the p-value. That is what p-value is. Some There was some question? No. So that is that is what it is. Now, this ratio is called given different names depending on what is the uh, distribution of your data. If it is normal distribution perfectly, you it's z value this ratio is called sometimes t value sometimes it is called f value and uh, so there are different uh, ways of uh, uh, expressing this ratio but remember that is a fundamental thing so <clears throat> uh, this reminds you of something like uh, what a, a criminal code does you know they start with the idea that there is the this is this person is innocent then they look at the evidence and see given this evidence what is the probability that this person is innocent if it is very small then they will give a judgment uh, against the uh, uh, alleged person and pronounce them guilty it's something like this which is which goes on so <clears throat> I will I will give you a little bit about uh, more about p-value. Uh, this was first I think proposed by Ronald Fisher in 1920, and I already told you that this is a probability that a given experimental observation. In this case, the observation uh, we got in the vitamin C and the zinc trial is that there is a one-day difference on an average. It could have been more, maybe two days difference under a null hypothesis. And then what is that probability that we'll see this much difference given the noise of variation of the number of days, which was almost four. So that signal to noise uh, takes us to probability that we will see this much observation. That is what it indicates. What is the credibility of the null hypothesis? Means if we said no difference, he, does it stand in front of the ratio? Uh, the other thing Ronald Fisher said is that you should be flexible in interpretation. Don't be so much bogged down by this p-value of 0 0.05 or less. And if you don't find uh, a significant difference or p-value is uh, not small, but it is, uh, let's say, more than 0.1 or 0.2, don't say that that is an evidence to accept the null hypothesis. Only thing you can do is you are unable to reject null hypothesis. So when we take talk about interpretation of p-value, we don't say that accept null hypothesis or reject null hypothesis. We say either you reject null hypothesis or you do not reject null hypothesis. Not, not that we accept null hypothesis. This is uh, based, uh, there is another way of inferential method which Ronald Fisher described for likelihood rate approach, but we are not going to go into it. There is another method which he called fiducial inferences, we are not going to go into it. So let's go through a story of uh, friends uh, tossing a coin. I think 
those of you who have heard this story will remember that uh, five uh, friends got together and they planned to go to a five-star hotel for a dinner. And they said that, look here, uh, let us do a, something to make the evening enjoyable. Let us toss a coin. And uh, what we will do is somebody who gets maximum number of heads before getting a tail will get a free dinner, means the rest of the other four will pay for that person. So let's just start tossing the coin. So they tossed a coin and uh, this is what they got. Five friends, A, B, C, D and E. A, first toss he got head and the second toss he got tail, he had to stop because that is where, that is what is the real rule of the game. As soon as you get tail, you stop. B got a little luckier. He got three heads and then one tail. He had to stop. He appears like he is going to win the race and get a free dinner. Then the C came. Very unfortunate fellow got tail on the very first toss and of course got disappointed. D tried and got two heads and a tail. But E really got five heads in a row and then got a tail. So after this happened, they started fighting with each other. And they said, no, E was doing some kind of trick. It is not possible that you will get five heads in a row. And then uh, they went to a person to, uh, let's say, and they came to you, all of you, to decide actually he is doing the trick or not. This was to be decided by four. So uh, who was doing a trick? Nobody said A was doing a trick or B was doing a trick, C was doing a trick or D was doing a trick. But most of the people said E must have been doing some trick. Now, if it was an offline class, I would have taken a vote, but obviously this is another problem with online classes. But uh, <clears throat> this, this was decided that E was doing a trick. So the real winner is B, not the E. And uh, that uh, fight continued. But forget about the fight and the dinner. Just think about it, whether this is really possible without doing a trick or not. Uh, a, getting one head, 50% chance, uh, which is not a really unlikely, very likely. Somebody got head first, 50% chance. Then another head, that was also a 50% chance. So getting two head together means in a row, first head also and second also, as uh, 50% of 50%, which is 25% chance. Get third row, which is another, uh, you can say, 50% probability. So 50%, then 50% chance here. So this and this together, 0 0.5 into 0 0.5, 0 0.25. Then again, 0 0.5, which will be uh, 125, so 12.5%. Similarly, you can calculate the percentages. I'm not going to do that in every case. But this had a 50% chance. B, uh, what he got had 25, 12.5% probability. D, 25% probability. What E got did is also possible without a trick, which is 3% probability. And as you can see, everybody was of the opinion that this he was doing a trick, it is not acceptable. When this figure got to 3%, you rejected this idea that he was not doing any trick. Similar, I think, experiments must have been going on when Ronald Fisher must be doing it or sitting with the students. And he found a tendency that, uh, or maybe some other scientists, that whenever the probability goes below 5%, then people are willing to reject that there is no trick in this coin tossing. And uh, this 
this is how perhaps the, there was a decision that human beings reject uh, hypothesis of no trick if the probability of something happening is less than 5%. And that is how perhaps p value of 0 0.05 came. But uh, Ronald Fisher did not say that you calculate or uh, interpret on the basis of p value of 0 0.05. He always talked about flexible interpretation. Look at everything, look at other things before you uh, start saying that p-value of less than 0 0.05 is something which is to be excited about. But then another group of people came and said, we have to take a decision. Flexible interpretation, which means think about this, think about that, make a judgment. That uh, is too much hassle. Let's have some decision-making role. This decision-making role was brought by, in 1928, by Neyman and Pearson, who said that, look here, we should think about testing a hypothesis. You have null hypothesis, you have alternative hypothesis. If p-value is more than 0 0.05, then do not reject the null hypothesis. It shouldn't be written except do not reject the null hypothesis. But if p-value is less than 0 0.05, then reject null. This is what they uh, propagated, which means they, whether it is 0 0.049, you reject the null hypothesis. If it is 0 0.0001, then also you reject null hypothesis. So no difference between 0 0.049 and 0 0.001. And that is, uh, uh, has become a kind of uh, rule of the game, which whole world is following. Carl Anderson uh, wrote that I have seen many graduate students doing their, their data analysis. And when they get a p-value of 0 0.052, they feel depressed. They look dejected and head for the pub. Maybe he uh, was talking about Australia, or where pubs are very common. So they, they head for the pub. But the same students, when they get a p-value of 0 0.049, they are delighted, highly excited. In this excitement, what did they do? They head for the pub. So either way, they head for the pub. The idea is to go to the pub. But basically, the difference is the between p-value of less than 0.05 and more than 0 0.05. So <clears throat> one uh, thing which you ought to know is that p-value is talking about data which you have seen in a sample, like 214 patients in vitamin C and uh, this uh, jinx trial. That was the sample data. And then you are trying to decipher what will happen in the population. That is, if millions of people get, take vitamin C and zinc, what will happen? That is what you are trying to do. And uh, you are checking whether your data is compatible with null hypothesis or not. So null hypothesis, I told you, is decide vitamin C does not make a difference. That is the null hypothesis means there is no difference in the number of main days to get 50% reduction in symptoms, whether actually you take vitamin C or you don't take vitamin C. And then you check, we got a difference of one day. Is it compatible with null hypothesis or not? And that is where signal to noise ratio comes. And it answers the question, are the observed differences due to chance? Now, <clears throat> there are a lot of criticisms of p-value. And uh, one criticism is that this is very arbitrary dichotomy. And uh, it uh, ignores what we and how much we know about something already. So I'll tell you there was a trial of uh, rapid and uh, intense control of blood pressure in patients with intracellular hemorrhage. And p value came 0 0.06. And uh, I think authors were uh, either pressurized to write it this way or they interpreted this way. 
that intense BP control does not make a difference in the outcome of uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. This was being presented in an international forum where uh, I students said, I don't agree with this. We know so much about blood pressure. We know so much about its relationship with intracerebral hemorrhage that even if it has come P value of 0 0.06, I would take that uh, control of BP is actually good for people with intracerebral hemorrhage. This is an arbitrary dichotomy and we should not be guided by it entirely by this P value. The P value is often misused and it is liable to misuse. I will give you some examples of that and even uh, very often liable to misinterpretation as well. And I will also argue that it is less informative uh, and there are more informative ways of looking at the data. So if uh, P value is equal to 0 0.05, many people think the null hypothesis has only a 5% chance of being true. Now, this is not correct. Uh, if I uh, was having offline class, I would have taken a board. But uh, uh, this is what people think, which is completely wrong, because this p-value is calculated on the basis of assumption or hypothesis that there is 100% well, let's say null hypothesis is true, then what is the chance of seeing this? And if somebody has, uh, Stephen Goodman has written a lot about uh, p-value fallacy, and he said that, look here, p-value of 0 0.05, he is basically saying 13% 30, probability that null hypothesis is uh, actually probably true. P value of 0 0.03 gave, gives us 9% probability if, the, if you start with 50 50 probability. So it is not 5% when you say p value is uh, equal to 5.05. He wrote uh, a more, uh, I think, uh, severe criticism of p value and he called it a dirty dozen p value, 12 p value misconceptions. And uh, I'm not going into this uh, in detail, but if you are interested, you can read this. If you just enter dirty dozen p-values, you will get this from Google. Uh, one of the misconceptions is that people, and particularly doctors who are not very well trained in mathematics or statistics, they thought that a statistically significant finding is clinically important. And often this is not true. Uh, First, because the difference may be too small to be clinically important. And this is not, uh, I'm saying, a well, lot of people have written about this. P values tells nothing about the magnitude of it, whether it is clinically important or not. So one day difference, if you have 2,000 uh, COVID-19 patients, may turn out to be statistically significant, which is P value less than 0 0.05, depending on whether the same kind of data is um, seen over 2,000 patients or not. But that doesn't mean it is important because you rightly thought that one day is not a worthwhile difference. It is not clinically important, even, even if p-value is uh, less than 0 0.05. Studies with the same p-value provide the same evidence against the null hypothesis. No, that is also not true because dramatically different observed effects can have the same p-value. I told you it depends on the noise, signal to noise ratio. So depending on the data, you may have different signal to uh, same signal to noise ratio for different kinds of data. And uh, often mis a mistake which was done by uh, many of our predecessors uh, and experts uh, in medicine that a scientific inclusion or treatment policy was based on whether or not the p-value was significant. And uh, I have already told you that people often thought if p is equal to 0 0.05, then there is 5% chance of this being true. And this is the dirty dozen uh, of uh, uh, Stephen Goodman about p-value misconceptions. I will come, I will not discuss all the 12 if you are really keen you can read about it but i will discuss a few 
I'll discuss one, for example, from the stroke area. And in fact, uh, uh, this was a study which stimulated me to write uh, a letter to the editor, uh, which was published, I think, in 1994 or 93. Uh, <clears throat> patients with acute stroke were taken, and they were given what is called heparin induced corporeal low density lipoprotein precipitation very big name in short they were they called it help heparin extracorporeal low density precipitation so they took uh, the acronyms help so some people were given standard treatment some people were given help plus standard treatment and then they looked at barthel index which tells you about uh, activities of daily living functioning of patients and also some other uh, parameters. But look at the Barthel index, which tells you about activities of daily living. 100 is the full score, which is basically person is fully independent. And uh, as lower the Barthel index, less is the degree of independence. Uh, but uh, the grading is done 0, 5, 10, 0, 5, 10 for each of the activities of daily living, whether it is uh, using toilet or walking or dressing and so on. And they found in the help group, 89.2 was the bathroom index. In the standard treatment group, 86.2. And this has been published in uh, respectable journal stroke, a difference of three, which was statistically significant, p value less than 0.05. They also took uh, MMSC, which was also p value less than 0.05. We don't need to gain in going to that. And the way they wrote uh, the conclusion was the aphoresis. This is like a aphoresis, look aphoresis, uh, like dialysis kind of machine, causes an immediate and significant improvement of clinical symptoms, which so far has not been achieved by any hemorrheologically active substance to a comparable degree and time. So the, see the way they write this. Immediate and significant improvement of clinical symptoms. Now we know that if somebody is not able, is bedridden, if he is able to turn a little bit, there is a change in the scoring of five. So uh, when we don't even have any meaning of three, even though statistically significant, it is clinically meaningless. So the, let, the title of the letter to the editor, which I wrote, is statistical significance versus clinical significance. That is, if some of you want, you can read it. On the other hand, there is another example that is from epilepsy, published in the England Journal of Medicine. 149 children with epilepsy free of attacks for two to four years so they are not getting it they are on treatment how soon we should taper some people tapered in one group was tapered in six weeks rapidly one group was tapered over nine months so for example if somebody is on carbamazepine of say 600 milligram per day then 200 milligram every three months uh, or say 800 milligram per day, 200 milligram every three months, you go on decreasing in nine months, you stop. There was another group where it was done in six weeks, rapidly. every, you know, two weeks, there was a decrease of 200 milligrams. So those 16 patients were lost to follow up, but when they looked at recurrence of attack over a period of one year, I think, then 43% record in the rapid tapering, 36% record in nine months. So chi-square test uh, was done, which gave a p-value of 0.46, and the authors concluded, concluded that there is no difference. Now, if you look at the numbers, there is signal. The signal is about 7%. But obviously, there was noise, which did not allow it to reach statistical significance. This is often, uh, very often, due to small sample size, which is 149 children. But you are making a conclusion which will be applied to millions of children. So you better do another study to see whether this difference of 7% is really not, uh, you'll say, stable or sustainable 
over a period of let's say 200 children or 300 children and then if you perhaps if this is sustained then you may find a statistically significant difference uh, now when we they looked at the confidence interval uh, which we looked at there was a 12 percent difference uh, which is was in favor of six week to 24 percent difference which was in favor of slow tapering will come to confidence interval later on so it was probably a false negative result so help treatment false positive rapid tapering false negative that is because you rely too much on PMS. This is why in 1985, Bonacott wrote, I apologize to the whole medical profession for that mischievous misnomer, statistically significant. I hope that statistically significant eventually becomes a historical footnote. And I agree with him because the words statistically significant to a clinician means, and I, want, I was also looking at it uh, in this way before uh, 1992, that anything which is statistically significant must be clinically, because the word significant is there. We didn't understand what is statistically thing, but significant word is there. In fact, I, I often say that uh, it is, uh, it should be replaced by something called uh, let's say statistically apparent or statistically detectable. That means if you can detect statistically, that means it is unlikely to be due to chance. So that's all which is which it says. But the word significant uh, is uh, very persuasive for uh, you know his statistically naive person. Uh, Rothman wrote the notion of statistical significance could be expunged from the lexicon of the epidemiologist with no loss. And Garden and Altman wrote the use of p-values has detracted from more useful approaches to interpreting study results such as estimation and confidence interest. So that is what uh, they wrote. Uh, and there is a article, the end of p-value, and so on. Many people have uh, written about against email so what they recommend is to use confidence interval approach and uh, <clears throat> this uh, i can in the context of uh, up election we can replace Barack obama by yogi or so yogi's popularity rating let's say in the newspapers says it is 55 percent with an error of plus minus 10 percent so those of you who know they know that this is an error of 10 percent which means it is quite possible that yogi's popularity may be 45 percent or maybe 65 percent so if it is 45 percent then probably he is going to lose the election if it is 65 percent then he is go definitely going to win the election and uh, therefore this uh, survey which was reporting 55 percent with plus minus error of 10 percent is not a informative survey or at least uh, requires to be done on a larger sample um, how to reduce the error to reduce the error you have to increase the sample size. They always do this kind of survey on the sample size, which sometimes is small, sometimes it is big. So bigger the sample size, less is the error, and narrower is the width of what is, this is what is called confidence interval. And the question is, how much width of confidence interval is acceptable? You see, if there was a survey which gave 52% with error of plus minus 5%, this will be acceptable because even in the worst case, it, he has, uh, I know it, it will not be acceptable because worst case will be 47%, whereas best case will be 57%. Which means 57% he's going to win, 47% he's not going to win. But if you have a survey which gives a rating of 65% plus minus 10%, this is a very decisive survey, very informative. 
because it gives clear idea even in the worst case of 55 percent he is going to win and in the best case 75 percent of course he is going to win so it uh, all depends on what is the sample size and what is the finding so width of the confidence interval is basically telling you uh, uh, how much is the sample size apart from the fact that of course uh, what is the finding and what are the percentages also matter but width depends a lot on sample size bigger the sample size narrower is the confidence interval and a good a range of confidence interval or width is the one which gives you same answer on the both its ends because whether it is 55 percent 65 percent we know that both gives the same answer that somebody is winning the election if it is different on the two limits of the confidence interval that means it is not a good confidence interval it needs to be uh, uh, repeated or at least uh, done in a larger sample size. So what does 95% confidence interval tell you? That you are 95% confident that the true effect is within that range. Now where it is in the range, we don't know. You depict it by a point in the center, like in this case, we our survey, we will 65% will be like a point, and then plus minus 10% will be shown as a line on the either side. So the point in the center is sometimes called point estimate and the line on either side is denotes the values is uh, are the range of possible values consistent with the data so uh, let us have these uh, examples of this study two studies have been done on some intervention and uh, study b it has this confidence interval and study A has this confidence. Now study B also found a difference of 0%. Study A also found a difference of 0%. But the confidence intervals are different. Now I would have asked you to interpret this, but basically study B is telling us that uh, obviously it had a larger sample size that probably uh, this intervention is useless and uh, we can be very confident 95 percent confident that this is a useless thing it doesn't do doesn't make any difference at all whereas in study a we can't be so confident because the truth may be that it is 45 percent less uh, mortality if mortality is the outcome or 48 percent more so this study a is a better called uh, inconclusive study or highly imprecise study whereas study b is a very precise study giving you very precise answer now this is so both have very different messages but if you did only p-value both will give you p-value of one so p-value does not distinguish between a large study which gives a definitive conclusion uh, from a study which is highly imprecise and inconclusive. Another example will be study D and C. Uh, I'm comparing different interventions. And uh, this also has very large sample size, obviously very tight confidence interval, which is from here to here, from minus 0.1% to minus 2%, which means it shows some effect. Obviously, when you don't cross the line, that means it is effect is certainly more than zero and uh, it decreases, let's say, mortality is the outcome, then as much as uh, maybe uh, as little as 0.1% or as much as 0.2%. Another in study C, which has this confidence interval, whereas there is 10% difference, but it could be as high as 20% less mortality or maybe as low as 1%. So this, these two, uh, I'll also give different messages. This is a, a large study with small difference. This is a smaller study with potentially big difference. But p-value is same in both, 0 0.03.
So p-value does not distinguish between a large study with a small effect and a smaller study, in this case, 10 times less sample size, where is potentially big effect. So here probably you are more sure that certainly this makes a clinically important difference, though you may like to have another study and do a meta-analysis to see exactly whether they are close to 10% or 20% or closer to uh, minus 1%. So that is okay, but at least you have the idea that this is potentially better treatment than intervention Q. So uh, another example of same p-value but different confidence interval and same effect, different p-values in this case. So there are a lot of situations where p-values does not distinguish between uh, things which you can distinguish by using confidence. I think uh, uh, I will conclude by saying that we always talk about 95% confidence interval, but you can talk about 99% confidence interval or 90% confidence interval. Now, suffice it to say that more confident you want, you want to be, obviously it will give you a wider range so that uh, it captures the truth with more certainty. Whereas if you want to be only 90% confident, the confidence interval will be narrower. So depends, but most of the journals and most of the world has accepted 95% confidence interval as something which is acceptable. So that is how the world goes, but it doesn't mean uh, that people can't take 99% confidence interval in some studies. Now, there is a correlation between p-value and confidence interval. And I will take that up maybe in a subsequent talk. And uh, uh, please write email whether you want to know uh, more about uh, what is the relationship between p-values and confidence interval. Or if you uh, are not interested, we can take another topic. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take. It's 10 o'clock, so we will stop here. Any question? Uh, yes, sir. Can I ask you one question? Uh, good morning, sir. This is Abhishek from Maranasi. Yes, Dr. Abhishek. Yes, yes. How are you doing? Great, sir. I'm doing great, sir. It's always a great, great pleasure to listen to you. And uh, I can listen to you all of my life when you, uh, you. When you talk on statistics. But, sir, um, uh, just a small query. You showed one of the uh, in one of my, you. Uh, sorry, I joined a bit late. I did institute mortality meeting. So uh, in one of your slides, uh, you showed a study where lesser the p value, uh, greater is the chance. Lesser is the chance that uh, the null hypothesis will be true. So why have they chosen this as? I mean, many papers and in when I was a resident under working under you, I mailed you a JAMA paper where it talked less. Let's uh, put down or let's bring down the value of p to less than maybe 0 0.002. While mm -hmm. some experts say uh, p value just tells you the chances of it being true and uh, rejecting the null hypothesis. But your paper that you showed, it's it's obviously would be great if you could reject the null hypothesis by great margins. So why not bring down those margins to even more uh, like 0 0.02 or 0 0.001? Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, last year, I think last year or last to last year, there was uh, uh, there were a number of writers, and uh, if I remember correctly, uh, guy from California, I think uh, Stanford, he uh, Ian Londis uh, suggested that we should now go to p-value less than 0 0.001, or at least 0 0.01 rather than 0 0.05. He was advocating 0 0.001 so that we don't keep making the same mistakes. People are so much used to p-value of something that uh, they will stick to it. They will not uh, easily transit to confidence interval. So let us make it more stringent. And that was the proposal which uh, uh, many people really supported it. But uh, to get that p-value, you know, it is harder for the... Uh, research enterprise to get it because you need a larger sample size. 
Really? You know, uh, the companies which really do big studies, all the vaccines which you have seen, all the big drugs or monoclonal antibodies, which they come, they come in big companies. So uh, there is a, naturally a resistance to go to p-value less than 0 0.001. Uh, but yes, it, people will make less mistake if, let's say, p-value was reduced to 0 0.001 to declare what they call statistical significance. Thank you, sir. And sir, just one more query, if you allow me, sir. Sure, sure. Yeah, the, when talking of clinically meaningful, significant, uh, clinically significant thing, say if I'm uh, doing an intervention trial where I want to uh, decrease the spasticity, and I'm not sure what scale reduction, say on modified ranking scale, um, on the spasticity scale, would it be good? Uh, so how, I mean, uh, I understand that there are few things, few clinical endpoints where it's not a matter of debate what clinically meaningful it would be. But there yeah. are a few things um, like headache days, maybe spasticity scale. So how do you decide uh, what would be, if you are planning a study, what is, how do you decide that what a clinic, clinically meaningful reduction what? scale would be? Very good question. Very good question. So uh, I will give you a short answer because uh, this, uh, this can be another topic which we can spend one hour on this. Uh, but a short answer will be that how do we define what is clinically important? It should be both uh, based on clinician's response as well as patient's response. So what many people have done is they have looked at various differences and asked uh, patients, how do you feel? means they have looked at their uh, quality of life or if it is a pain scale, then how much difference. Really, patients also feel that, yes, I'm better. So <clears throat> then they, uh, both clinicians and patients, uh, if you see the response at, at this point, patients say that they feel definitely better. Clinicians also say, I think uh, from my point of view, my patients are definitely better. Sometimes only patient's response is taken depending on the instrument. Sometimes it is patients as well as doctors. And then you decide a cutoff. This is the threshold where patients definitely feel better. We will call it clinically important. So for every scale, there should be a threshold decided that this much difference will be called clinically important. Thank you. It sir. has been done. It has been done for some scales. So you can read it. It has not been done for most scales. Right. Again, because it uh, requires a study. But uh, this is a very good question. There is. Thank, uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Sir, sir good morning, sir. Kumar Velu here, sir. Um, good morning. Velu. Yes, Dr. Kumar Velu. Yes, tell me. A very good lecture as usual, sir. You are my teacher thank also. You. Thank you. Thank sir, you. Uh, sir, two questions I've got, sir. What is type A and type B error? And how does even as our main problem is when our PGs decide on a thesis topic, the number yes. needed number of patients, these two questions, if they'd be, it will be very useful to postgraduate, sir. Uh, very good question. I think uh, based on your request, I'm going to take up this as a next topic, Dr. Kumar Velu. What is type one sir. error? What is type two error? And what is the sample size we need? so that postgraduates can determine uh, their thesis sample size. I have already done it for uh, RIMS people, but I don't mind repeating it because uh, this is a very important topic. And uh, I will like all your postgraduates to join and listen. I will give a very simple formula, which is published also. I have published it in National Medical Journal of India, uh, but it is for a randomized trial. We can extend that formula to other case control and cohort study also, but that will be something I will like to do next time. But very briefly, type one error is false positive error and type two error is false negative error, but more details next time. Yes, thank pleasure you, sir. Thank you very much. Sir. Pleasure listening to you and uh, my own uh, former students, They when they join, it's a pleasure. Hey, we keep learning still, sir, from you. Thank you. And any other, any other question?
sir ganesh here sir yes dr ganesh sir uh, i think the coming to the point of p value uh, i think for many studies we like like in genetic studies the p value has been significance level has been reduced to 5 into 10 to the power minus 8 yes i mean and so uh, so the, the previous question from our previous speaker that uh, so there are ways where you can still there are studies designs where you can reduce the p values right yes yes uh, uh, genetics is an exception of the rule because in genetics because there are 3 billion base pairs and uh, the genome wide genotyping studies they do thousands and thousands millions of tests for each of the snips you see and so many snips are there so there is uh, uh, it is called correction of the p value or bond for any correction that more tests you do you have to divide 0.05 by the number of tests you have done so since you are doing millions of tests uh, for so many snips which are already existing in human genome you have to reduce p value accordingly and that is why very rightly in genetics less than uh, 5 into 10 to the power minus 8 is the threshold to declare significance which is i think a very reasonable thing to do. okay so if there are no more questions thank you very much for joining it has been uh, a really uh, pleasure to have these questions and uh, very good questions thanks a lot thank you sir thank you so much sir.